So welcome to this session about understanding biosphere economy. A special welcome also to the panelists, Sean Paul, People Planning Holdings. And we have Alejandro Litovsky from the Earth Security Initiative and Per Olson from Stockholm Resilience Center. <coughs> and my name is Johanna McTaggart and I work with a biosphere reserve that's situated about 450 kilometers north of here. And uh, for us, biosphere economy is a very relevant issue that we're working with. We're right now trying to create a support system that would uh, help stimulate entrepreneurship that is based on using the resources in the biosphere. So I'm very happy to lead this session. Um, so I would like to start with you and ask you to introduce yourself a little bit more. My name is Sean Paul uh, with People and Planet Holdings. Uh, this is a uh, private equity fund to invest in the expansion of social enterprises working at the intersection let's say, of rural livelihoods and uh, green economy or biosphere economy. And my come to this work uh, coming out of 20 years working with the organized rural poor in Latin America who I've been working with on a number of models of bridging between what is effective community governance of natural resources with what are uh, successful approaches to sustainable livelihoods. Hi everyone, uh, Alejandro Litovsky, um, the founder of the Earth Security Initiative. Um, and um, uh, my main uh, interest and concern is, is to begin to address the, the issue of how um, reaching ecological limits, reaching resource limits, and, and, and coming into a new world virtually of, of, of scarcity of things and materials and resources, um, water, food, energy, and, and basic things we need in order to, to, to progress, essentially creates a number of new uh, security and risk um, uh, threats uh, that we need to acknowledge and, and factor in uh, to the way we think about investment and the way we think about um, capital and asset um, allocation. Yes, yes, you can hear me, yeah. Uh, I'm Per Olsson. I'm, as Johanna said, at the Stockholm Resilience Center. We are a research organization within the, within the Stockholm University. Uh, we, um, we are, in general, we're doing, um, we're doing uh, uh, science and research on, on, the, on the sort of the governance of, of, the, of, the, of the planet and, uh, and uh, especially focusing on uh, human environment interactions. Uh, we, uh, I personally, I'm a, a theme leader for the adaptive governance theme uh, at the center, and and working on transformations, uh, trans uh, sustainability transitions, and and how those uh, happen, which I will come back to. Thank you. So I would like to uh, Alejandro, if you could start describing biosphere economy for us. Well. You know, in a way, the, 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 the story of the idea, it, it, was, it was to create something that would um, create a vision of, of what the end game looks like. And the end game looked like an economy that worked in sync with nature's cycles. Right? Um, and um, for, for me, um, at, at the time, uh, let's say the, 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 the most interesting uh, challenge was to see um, that virtually every single industry that we've set up, and industrial uh, sectors, as well as uh, government and policy uh, regulation, in a way is not um, is 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 not uh, in line with the sort of limits and you know to take a first term the planetary boundaries that we need to to regulate. So, what would it look like you know, if we try to imagine what would it look like to have an an, ec an economy, a formal economy, of large industrial sectors, basically? Uh, that are regulated uh, by the boundaries of the planet, i.e. how much water is left, how much uh, forest we need to preserve in order to keep rainfall um, cycles uh, you know, um, happening at the, at the degree that is necessary to irrigate crops and so on. Um, and the reality today is that if you look at the agriculture sector, that is not happening. You know, we've gone into a paradigm of very large-scale mechanized agriculture with huge sort of uh, 
uh, over pumping fertilizers and chemical chem chemical fertilizers that it's leading to a you know in the in, in in the planetary boundary sense you know we're crossing the threshold of how much nitrogen the earth cycles can sustain so very clearly that's an example of how uh, how do how can we get this industrial sector back into the uh, into the you know a safe operating space, no? and so there's a critical L, there's a critical bridge there that needs to be built, I think, between the biophysical, si scientific sort of the the data. What what do we know about the 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 carrying capacity of certain of certain uh, uh, resources and ecosystems? And on the other hand, how do we think about how do we rethink about the the um, the, the different areas of capital allocation and, and, and investment and infrastructure? No? And so for me, that that was you know, it, it, it was about the bigger picture. It was, a big, the, it was about the, the billions and trillions of investment that really need to change. Um, and so the way I came at impact investing and, and you know, the smaller projects, the sort of inspiring cases of, uh, you know, eco charcoal in East Africa or, you know, forest conservation in, in the Amazon or sustainable fishing in a, in a coastal community in, in, in Asia. The, the, the logic was that actually these were, you know, the early indications of a broader vision of actually how you could do fishing or how you could deal with agriculture, or how you could deal with um, um, of, of forest, forest, uh, forestry, right? Um, and, and so that's essentially the, I think that the key point is that within a vision of a biosphere economy, you re inherently you have the question of how do we scale up these approaches? And if we are, you know, investing capital, uh, some of the investors here are thinking about, you know, in the, in the threshold of one to ten million for particular projects, uh, and that's exciting. That's terribly exciting, and you're obviously dealing with a number of huge constraints because the system is not geared to that. And so, if you're trying to do, uh, I was involved in a project in um, in uh, East Africa with biochar, and basically a huge driver of deforestation in East Africa is uh, is that people are going and cutting down the forest and turning it into charcoal to be able to cook, to be able to have energy and so on. Uh, and how do you change that? So you had the typical entrepreneur, very small scale, that was looking for, for investment from people like you that was, had developed a very simple technology. And this was basically the old oil tank or barrels, you know, rusty and the whole thing, that they cut them up and they created these little ovens where you would put biomass in uh, and you would cook it and then have a biological charcoal that prevented people going off. And, but ima just imagine, I mean, 98% of the population of millions of Tanzanians that depend on a market of, of wood charcoal that then is sold in the cities, you know, on the corners and so on. And here you had these guys you know, with a new idea uh, that could potentially transform the market, but it was, and when you talk to them, you realize it was, it's, it's impossible for these guys to reach that level of scale, right? And so I think for me, it's, it's always been a question of, of how do you work with that early stage investment that will enable them you know, to prototype, they, you know, to learn about how to rival the distribution networks that are happening in, the, in down, downtown Dar, Dar es Salaam and, and other Tanzanian cities, and progressively create an imitation effect and create the industry. And so that, I think, is the, the bottom line of that original idea of, of uh, thinking about a biosphere economy that that would enable us collectively to, th to think about, okay, what does the end game look like? What do we need in order to solve this problem uh, of, 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 of charcoal, of deforestation driven, uh, you know, ch charcoal uh, sector? And so that requires, uh, you know, thinking about that particular startup, but very quickly, you know, shifting the mindset to, to basically say, okay, what are the market infrastructures in which we need to invest in order to enable many more entrepreneurs getting into this particular sector, the right regulations to perhaps prohibit the selling of, of deforestation, uh, of, of forest uh, charcoal and, and so on. And if you think about any, any uh, sector, whether it's fish, coastal fisheries, you know, it's happening in West Africa today, uh, that you have you know, the little boats uh, doing a sustainable fishing and in the horizon you see these massive industrial trawlers that are scooping up you know, football size uh, 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 nets of fish. And so I think that we are challenged, and as a sector, as an impact investor, uh, investing sector, we are also challenged to how do we make the connection between these two things, the, the really exciting in, uh, particular investments, 
and the broader scale of the challenges, given that we really don't have uh, enough time. We just don't have time. And so, and so that, I think, is a very important question of what can impact investors do with mm -hmm. that million dollars, with that $10,000, perhaps, uh, in order to try to shift, uh, shift that, that, you know, uh, that conversation. So, <coughs> really, uh, we also have uh, huge challenges here on Earth uh, with the resources are very limited and we have also, of course, the planetary boundaries. So how can we work with the biosphere economy within that uh, framework? Oh, well, um, just to say something about the planetary boundaries first. Uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with that concept. Raise a hand if you have heard it. Have. Have heard it. Well, so it's a fair amount, about half, maybe a little bit more. So the planetary boundaries is not really a new, uh, a radically new thing. It's, it's, uh, it builds on a lot of other concepts that have been developed uh, throughout history, uh, which builds on this idea that you mentioned, that uh, carrying capacity, that nature has a carrying capacity, that uh, um, which has been transformed into, if you heard about ecological footprints, etc. Herman Daly also used that kind of thinking in his work um, and it's been used in limits to growth, etc. Uh, so the planetary boundaries is a way to, to sort of package that in a, a bit, n sort of a new way on, on, at a really global scale, linking it to the Anthropocene, which is this uh, geological time uh, period that we're some people argue that we're in now, where we are, uh, where we are a major hum humans are a major force, and uh, in not only um, biological processes but also uh, geological processes, um, and uh, and also focusing on nine sort of critical boundaries that we need to focus on and uh, including climate change, ocean acidification, the nitrogen you mentioned, uh, etc. So it's, it's to help uh, policymakers to, to be more focused in, in their work um, and to give them some guiding. But there's no, there's no sort of numbers in it. It's not, not like if we pass this number, this threshold, then it will all go to, to hell. But it's more of a of um, that's why they call them boundaries, planetary boundaries, instead of planetary thresholds or tipping points. Um, but I think uh, when he, if you link that to what you talked about uh, and the biosphere economy, I think the big challenge is to sort of how do we how do we feed nine billion people uh, in the future uh, and stay within these boundaries? That's the it's a huge challenge, and. Uh, and there's a lot of argue, still people argue or, or live in that sort of thinking that we, oh, well, let's take care of human well-being first and then we take care of nature. Let's fix the people's um, livelihoods and, and, uh, uh, and the problem with that, and uh, history has shown that, that that's a very, it's, it's not a good way to do it. It's better, what we, the challenge now is to, to to increase human well-being and uh, at the same time as we increase the capacity of ecosystem, the biosphere, to produce the services that we depend on. Because if, if, um, if we only take care of human well-being first uh, and, and wait with the environment, it will come back and bite us in the back down the road. Uh, and uh, the Green Revolution in Asia has, has shown that. that uh, it helped a lot of people out of poverty, but but we're facing huge problems uh, at the moment with the uh, eutrophication and uh, and um, um, uh, almost poisoned uh, soils, etc., and and also uh, ruined a lot of social structures uh, in the process. Um, and reduced uh, diversity, both cultural and uh, biological. So it's it's. I feel like that's that's the that's the link here. That's the that's the big challenge for me is that is that uh, uh, raise human well-being and 
uh, at the same time increase the capacity of ecosystems to generate service. I want to make that point again because I think it's a key in this. I stop there because otherwise I just go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> I should also uh, actually mention that we will hopefully have some time at the end for questions from the audience. So if you have any really clever thoughts about things you want to ask us, then feel free uh, at the end of this uh, session. We'll have 10 minutes, perhaps. Um, <coughs> so, John, what does it mean to move capital into biosphere economy? I think, clearly, I think one of the things we're hearing, you know, when we look at business or development, poverty reduction, there's a, well, there's a clear end business. We're all, uh, typically focused on financial and economic considerations. I think a lot of the conversation is saying, well, we also have social considerations that need to be valued. And I guess we might agree as a panel that we need to look at it together with the environment. Mm -hmm. So when we move capital into how do you support, I think there was some good framing that we heard earlier today around this issue of scale and scope. And when we look at a biosphere economy, we know we need to look at a systemic approach, a holistic approach. Yet there's a real challenge in doing that and moving capital into a holistic approach where there's a lack of focus. And when we have a, you know, traditional, um, something that has worked for us to a, to a degree in business, to, you know, focus on doing one thing really well and do a lot of it. And that creates silos and unintended consequences. So how does one move capital into a biosphere economy with those kinds of challenges? I think we need many kinds of capital. Um, just to give one example, some of my work was in investment capital, but it was the ability to create in Honduras, getting communities to manage and protect their water supply. And they self-finance that so that they charge a voluntary fee to pay for, their, to, for potable water. That fee is managed by uh, community water boards that are elected by that community. And that becomes a seed fund of that community that they're, they're able to grow, and that money goes into assuring clean water, planting trees, and, um, and, uh, and it's been growing. So that's been replicating. It's been a self-replicating process of communities teaching communities how they can self-finance um, access to clean potable water. In that case, outside capital was technical assistance, grant finance technical assistance, but the ultimate sustainability uh, depends upon those communities managing their own funds to invest in their own land and resources. When looking, uh, and I think when, that's one kind of fund. What I'm really excited about right now in looking at this biosphere economy, I think we're really at the early stages of impact investment and social enterprise in this arena. We're beginning to see debt. There's a ways that trade credits, trade finance, so coffee, I've done a lot of work with coffee. Coffee co-ops want to sell their product at a premium price on international markets. There's a lot of increasing instruments from, I'd say, social, so, social lenders and there's beginning some learning of more mainstream lenders. It's actually a good business to lend to um, organic fair trade coffee co-ops that are selling to you know, large um, international buyers. What's missing in that equation, and we see this across the board, is the lack of equity. Help these enterprises, whether they're um, inspired by nonprofits or uh, you know, values-driven entrepreneurs, we're seeing just a chronic lack of equity to help these companies grow smartly. So that kind of equity can go into a more traditional, um, can go into what we see um, a lot in the agricultural sector in the developing world is often organized around co-ops or farmer associations. And I think there are alternative approaches to how you can move uh, patient capital to support farmer associations that are based on revenue participation. And we're seeing that work with uh, commodities like chocolate, uh, spices, tea. Uh, so I think again and again we're able to see different kinds of capital. I think we need an ecosystem of capital types to meet an ecosystem of needs to help social enterprise grow in building a biosphere economy. It includes grants, it includes um, lending, and includes different kinds of equity. And I guess the other thing I just I'm pausing on this point, moving capital. Capital can only move, I think, successfully in this arena if there's good governance. So, and governance for me really begins with communities. Mm -hmm. Hopefully there's a strong and effective state, but I find that often in my work, it's really been re re relying on lo local good governance. So what are communities doing to really um, exercise and assure good governance decisions that I think is essential 
for mm -hmm. capital to move effectively. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So that's what we're seeing also in the innovation system that we're building right in the intersection of local indigenous knowledge and uh, more scientific knowledge, or you need that kind of community involvement in order to have a successful system, I think. But we're just starting this now, so we're kind of testing it out. Uh, but there's definitely a role for, for science and scientific knowledge uh, in this innovation system. So. How how do you think that um, this support system would spur the biosphere economy when coupling scientific knowledge with indigenous knowledge? Say again. What? How, uh, I didn't what did understand. I, <laughs> I didn't understand the question. Uh, okay. Say again. So, um, what role do you think science will have to spur the biosphere economy when coupling that knowledge with indigenous knowledge? Well, I think I think. Uh, Science uh, can help um, uh, both when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to you know the the ecology, understanding the the biosphere, understanding the 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 dynamics that you talked about that we need to be sensitive to, just to understand how they work. You know the the uh, how do you live with um, very dynamic ecosystems? Uh, sometimes, how do you live with that uncertainty and change, and and that you have, uh, and you and you have ecosystems, um, forests, etc. There are very complex systems, and they, there are thresholds, etc. So if you push too hard, they might flip and become a grassland, or you know they have. So just understanding that dynamics is is one thing that we can that we can help with, and we do a lot of work on on. On that, at the center, a lot of the uh, ecosystem dynamics of coral reefs, of forests, uh, you know, agri agricultural landscapes. So, so I think that's that's one thing where we. But one one thing that I feel like we we also can um, uh, help with and and uh, get in and be, be in the way that we can be part of this process is that, and that's closer to what I'm doing in, in my work is that this this um, knowledge about transformations uh, and and how transformation happens and how how these sustainability transitions happens because there's a there's a scientific knowledge gap there because science and and especially in my field of sustainability science science is very good at telling us how bad things are and showing us oh the state of the planet etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and also projecting things like if we continue what we're doing, we're going to end up in this place, you know, or this even worse, worse place. And then, and then there's the other side of uh, science that talks about um, an alternative state, the sort of the better place to be, and and that the work that Eleanor Ostrom is doing, for example, is developing design principles for that better state, and what sort of what we should be doing. But there's very little focus on how to get from the bad to the good, from A to B. And, and uh, we often leave that to the decision makers. We often leave that to, as, as, a, as a, we usually finish our scientific papers with policy rec recommendations, right? And, and, uh, and, uh, but, but what we're doing now is to sort of research that, the how of these transformations, of these shifts. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, work out there on social change from a complexity perspective, but a lot of it doesn't link to the biosphere or the ec ecology. So what we're focusing on is that human environment interaction, understand that as part of this transform transformation. So it's, for me, I'm, I'm quite new in this, in this, uh, in this arena that you're, that you're in with the social entrepreneurs, but, but, uh, what we're doing now is take, looking at how innovations that has that makes that link between the ecosystems and the and the social system, the social ecological innovations we call them sometimes, how how those are developed and how they are uh, how these innovations can have an impact, a large scale impact on on uh, how we how we interact with nature. Well, I was thinking that maybe <laughs> uh, I thought you were yeah. making a thing there. No, ah. ah, yes. No, I just wanted to drop a, um, 
uh, a different note in a way on the on the discussion because something that for me was um, at, at some point in my in my own work I started to find not enough teeth in the idea of the biosphere economy because it was a bit abstract you know? and, and talk about the economy is almost like it takes you into a you know a discussion of economics and models and externalities and valuation of natural capital and a lot of the things that mo many of you are familiar with are going on today my, in a way, um, motivation for creating the Earth Security Initiative was to uh, try to begin a more pragmatic discussion of saying that actually, of course, the value of ecosystems is very important, uh, putting a price on water, essential, but the reality is that I don't think that these things will happen in the next 10, 20 years. And, and at the same time, the real challenge that we face, that we all face, is, is a challenge of quantities. I, how much water is left, right? Uh, and, and that applies to impact investors, it applies to a Coca-Cola factory that is saying we are, we are increasing the efficiency per unit uh, of, of water, uh, water inputs to a bottle of Coke, but no one is really thinking about, okay, that's great, uh, actually how much water is left around the factory and, and, and how is that distributed? You know? uh, and when you see the projections for a Coca-Cola factory, the efficiency per product is increasing, but the production is also increasing, and so the total water consumption is also increasing. Right? Um, so my sense is that is, is two things, perhaps to, to provide us as input to the, um, to the discussion. The first is that we need to shift the discussion from a sort of theoretical, in a way the biosphere economy is a bit theoretical as well, to one that is very firmly grounded on quantities of resources. Uh, and that will draw on science and it will draw on, on, on resource statistics and all sorts of things. And, and we need to start thinking about how much we have and how, how much we have left. Uh, the second is, is just also draw, drawing on Per's comment earlier. Um, I have a very strong sense that the challenge of food security will redefine the sustainability agenda just like we know it, even how we are discussing it right now today. Um, because population is growing very rapidly because la land and soil is being degraded and eroded. Uh, and this is perhaps the biggest loss of natural capital that is a, a bit below the radar because soil erosion is not very sexy. I mean, not a lot of people talk about it. But it's massive, it's huge. It's the ability to grow something, right? Uh, water is decreasing, forests are disappearing, and we know rainforests are called rainforests because they produce rain, right? And we are altering all these systems in, a, in in such a way that it's in today becoming more and more difficult to grow food. And at the same time, the land that is traditionally being used to grow food is also being uh, used to grow other commodities and biofuels because our energy system now has directives that uh, require biofuels to become greener. And so a green economy in a way is accelerating risks in many ways. So my, my sense, and this is a, uh, something we've been exclusively focusing on from the Earth Security Initiative, we just launched a big report in March uh, that, that focuses on land as the nexus that brings all of these very practical risks together. And I think that this has a very, very big implication for impact investors. Um, in a way that I would feel is interesting not to think about how, you know, how impact investors invest in the biosphere is, is nice and inspiring, but I think there's a more pragmatic conversation to be had which is, what is the role of impact investors through their portfolios of creating stability in some of these very basic assets, and in particular in land? And so I think that the, that the big three areas that, that, that I would look for um, uh, in terms of portfolios going forward have more to do with, A, real estate. Um, and so we need to start talking about hectares of land and ownership and, and, and capital ownership of the territory, in a way. And so we need to start taking a different look at real estate investments and understand how are these real estate investments actually stewarding the, the, these essential capital. So what is the percentage of forest that we, you will leave standing in, you know, in, a, in a particular? And anyone that is following the Brazilian political uh, discussions on these, the, the forest code, uh, the big drawback from the, from the forest code right now is that it decreases the legal percentage of forest that you will be required to leave standing as a landowner. And so you can begin to see how all of these very different challenges that we face ultimately come down to a very practical uh, asset discussion on, on land and how you're going to use it and how you're going to develop it. 
And so that, I think the first is, is real estate. We should have, we should incorporate this into the discussion. The second is um, um, eco-agriculture, right? So it's, the second is agriculture, but actually how do we begin to bring in the whole sort of uh, agri uh, ecological agroforestry principles that are very practical, that will tell you that if you're going to develop a, plant, you know, a, a particular crop field, then there's certain very, very, uh, very physical limits to how much fertilizer you can use. Or there are very specific techniques on, on how you can in increase the fertility of the soil without adding extra nitrogen-based fertilizers. And we need to get very good at that very quickly. Yeah? And this is not an abstract discussion. It's basically uh, a technology discussion. And the same with water intensity of irrigation. It's a technology discussion that we need to have. Um, and I think the third is, 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 is on Sean's point, which is commodities. Uh, at the moment, the discussion of impact investing and commodities is very small. It's sort of the cocoa producers in Ghana, right? Which is very important. Uh, but there's a commodities investment discussion that is, is much bigger that I think many impact investors are in a position to play into today, given their assets and their portfolios, that also needs to start taking account of the security elements of the land uh, and how we will guarantee that the forest will be there, the water uh, catchments will be stewarded, that you know, water levels will be in safe levels, and, and these very practical things that I think will uh, do, do a lot to, to move the impact investing discussion forward. So I think overall, this, this, uh, you know, this idea of, uh, we're working on that we're calling it the land security agenda is, is basically taking a security uh, the perspective on land and how we need to guarantee a few things to ensure that, you know, I don't know if the whole planet, but at least that particular area and region will remain sort of resilient to some extent. No? Uh, we've been talking a lot about the challenges, but um, what are what are the strengths that we have? Um, the local communities uh, is that a strength to have a, a close collaboration with local communities? Uh, democratic societies is that a strength, or is it? What do you think about that? Yeah, of course, I think for me, uh, one of the things that we're working with on pe people and planet holdings is the issue of culture. So I think with culture, when you have strong, when, when I think about one of the, we talk about social environmental impacts, we're giving a lot of thought to the issue of cultural resilience. So especially with indigenous communities, we see that a lot of, um, there's a lot that we're able to succeed at. You're able to leverage what you might call social capital, community service that can, contributes to ecological restoration, that is, uh, contributes to making sure there's reliable water for farming, uh, for an activity that would be primarily commercial in nature. So I think that we do see a lot of trends. One trend I'm excited about with international trade is kind of with there's a current evolution uh, happening at, with fair trade. And um, one of those, one part of that evolution is direct trade. So the idea of I want to know where my food comes from. I want to know the farmer or community that made that food for me. And what we're seeing is with those trends, one, I think it helps, you know, it responds to a conscientious consumer. But we're also seeing it, it eliminates um, a lot of the middlemen in the traditional commodity uh, value chain. So what that means for the farmer is uh, where, I'm, where I'm actually just in Belize recently, and we're seeing actually prices are going up to the community. The revenue captured by the community is going up. They get to do less work, make more money with direct, direct trade relationships compared to what they were getting with fair trade organic. So I feel it's good competition for fair trade organic. How do we continue to improve value uh, to be able to, from um, communicating the social environmental value? But I think one of the drivers is the conscientious consumer. And I think that that really is allowing a lot to happen with, com with commodities. It's most developed with coffee, but I think there's some really important developments with palm. If you don't know about palm oil, it's in pretty much everything. We probably use it every day and don't know. And it has pervasive effects in terms of a, you know, what causes drivers of the loss of the rainforest, whether it's in Africa or um, Latin America or Asia. So when, now that there's a, there's a, is a call for what are, for just standards of sustainable palm. So that's, there's been some new efforts around that. How would we make palm oil? Palm oil, it comes from, a, uh, originally from Africa. It's a nut. We squeeze it. It's vegetable oil. It's in, um, industrial products, it's in our food products, and there have been really only uh, very early efforts to uh, declare some standards, and there's a huge demand. So I think these are some of the examples. We can do it for, by, by standards, 
by looking at these um, international trading relationships. And I'd say lastly, I think there's a lot around local living economies. How do we make this work at the local scale? I think part of it, we need to think global, but make it work local. So I think there's a, a number of examples I see um, in the United States where we see uh, business associations building around the country uh, that are how, you know, promoting local. So I think that's another uh, part of the solution I'm excited about is really seeing um, how to build the bridge between supporting local living economies uh, engaged in global trade. Great, great, thanks. Uh, I would now like to, uh, to have some questions from you, if you have any questions. You should have a microphone also. Oh, right here. Uh, per, I wanted to revisit uh, what you were saying in terms of sort of flipping the scientific discourse around constantly talking about the problems and focusing more perhaps on, and I, th I think this stems from the uh, tendency of science to see sort of advocacy as something that it shouldn't be doing, as opposed to maybe using the language of design to help people to understand the, the core ideas that are really functioning within projects. And I, I, I get the sense that a lot of the projects that aren't working aren't actually the, the, the study of, of scientific research. Um, that some of the, 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 the ways in which we can be looking at these very highly situated, deeply embedded, kind of like your project, Joanna, um, looking across kind of the cultural issues, the ecological issues, the economic issues. And I'm wondering in terms of the, the, the Stockholm Resilience Center and the work that you're doing, what's happening within that to be able to focus more sort of research funding, attention on being able to tell these stories in order to communicate the science, as opposed to the other way around, which is usually kind of a shock and awe tactic of scaring people of how bad things are, and then eventually, if you're lucky, you might get to a story about what humans are actually doing about it. Good question. Um, I think, uh, I, I would say my, my, my sort of spontaneous response would be not much is done. Uh, for that, it's it's um, it's just what you described. Most um, funding, etc., is for is for um, that that sort of general way of doing science and what they produce. I think I think there's another thing to that. Why just talk a little bit about that? Why why I think uh, a lot of scientists do a lot of these catastrophic kind of. Uh, uh, science and, and, and communication. I think there is, because media picks up on it, right? And, and if I, I'm a scientist and I want to be seen, like we always, we all want to be seen and, and appreciated. So if I'm a scientist and, and I have some, you know, stories and, I, and, and the story about the catastrophe, how we, how we were full speed ahead towards some, some, uh, some cliff, that will, that will get attention. But a story about you know a po more positive um, uh, sort of something that they achieved uh, like a community achieved in 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 Western Sweden so it doesn't get the same attention. So as a scientist, I sort of oh well, I got a lot of attention there, so I continue doing that. I will do more of that. I think there is a this kind of <laughs> relationship there, uh, and um, but I feel like it's almost like a a slow movement, I think, within science to, to uh, uh, as a reaction to that, actually, to, uh, to sort of focus more on, on, the, on, on the positive stories or the, or the, the, the storytelling of, of how, um, how things went well in one place. But the problem with that, of course, is is we have to get away from just being descriptive and, and just sort of saying um, this this is how it worked here to more doing comparative studies of a lot of cases and, and really try to to tease out you know the 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 key mechanisms and under which conditions these kind of transformations can can happen, etc. But there, I would say that the funding structure is is still you know I would say that. A lot of the funders, um, at least in Sweden, don't know what to do with that kind of uh, applications that we send in. You know, they they because they're transdisciplinary because the problem is 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 of that character. So you have to be transdisciplinary. So 
So it ends up between the chairs, you know, when, when, when these projects are going to be evaluated. They, oh, is this social science or is it natural science, you know? And, and there's a, I would say, very, very, um, uh, there's a slowness and a, and a rigidity there that is is not is is not encouraging this this kind of uh, work that you that you talk about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Balkfors. I work uh, with the Commission for Socially Sustainable Malmo. Uh, thank you for raising some very important, interesting aspects. Um, my, my question is about what, what do you think about measurements um, to be able to actually show the effect, effectiveness of um, um, implemented uh, issues and, and the, the effect of um, yeah, sustainability and social impact. Uh, we all know how to draw on dollar sign and we know the, the drawbacks of, of GDP. Um, what do you think about as, um, to be able to, to agree upon a new way to measure outcome? Uh, I'd say I feel that we are in the early days of having um, a streamlined approach to measuring impact. And there are a number of experiments out there. One that uh, I've been engaged with is B Corp. That that's one uh, new standard for benefit corporations. It's coming up with a standard. If you were a for benefit company, what, how would that be defined? And there is a, a relatively new um, organization that is accrediting people in the US as B cor corporations. And I you know that's kind of taking off in a number of places um, internationally. Related to that, I think the system that has the most traction around it for ratings is for investment and in impact investing is Gears. And I know they're presenting um, later at the conference. But I, again, I think it's, it's a, a system. If you think about what it took to have standardized practices in financial accounting, right, that didn't happen overnight. There were decades to come up with a standardized system for something as relatively uh, simple as financial accounting. Uh, but I think we're really at those early days of figuring that out for the impact space. Uh, so I'd say that, that those would be the two that I would point to. There are many others. I think there's some really interesting work, um, you know, with the um, around carbon accounting, carbon disclosure project, and the water disclosure project. I think some of the more interesting work I see for companies is that are beginning to develop ba environmental and social balance sheets. So in addition to a traditional balance sheet, it's beginning to look at what are the positive and negative social, social and environmental impacts that their their business is having. I think that's. Um, fairly, uh, I'd say, innovative, far from a mainstream practice, but there are some uh, significant companies that are beginning to do that. Do we have any uh, Perhaps more? to add oh, to, to that, okay. which uh, you mentioned GDP, and, and I think that there's, there's a lot, there's a very active uh, discussion at the moment around this. There's a commission uh, formed by the World Bank that is, you know, working with six countries. India is, 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 is very involved. Um, and that needs to change. I mean, it's obvious that it needs to change. You know, t today the way GDP wor works, uh, if a country is driving deforestation, GDP is going up because it's increasing the, you know, the goods and services that are being uh, accounted for in the economy. Uh, if you stop deforestation, then your GDP is very likely to go down. Uh, and so there's, I think there's a lot of experiments. And, and uh, Rachel Sina, are you here, Rachel? No. She's uh, from the Finance Lab. They're very involved in that sort of discussion uh, and, and also how do you account for externalities. If you ask me personally, is this being translated to the impact investing sector? I would say I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of initiatives working with metrics and how do impact investors uh, report on the results and so on. My sense is that, th that those efforts are not taking the perspective that we're talking about into consideration. Yes, they're reporting on social and environmental metrics, uh, but, but I think that there's a substantial space for innovation in terms of asking the, you know, metrics are essential, but the question is actually what do you have to measure? Uh, so if you were uh, telling us that, you know, there's a new redevelopment in the city of Malmo, you know, in the harbor, and they're going to change this and that, then, then clearly there would need to be a, a number of metrics put in place to that. And I think in terms of this discussion, there should be uh, metrics that will guarantee, say, the government in this case and the taxpayers, 
that uh, the ecological functions on which Malmo depends are being uh, you know, incorporated and, and stewarded. And then you would ask, okay, but what are those ecological functions? I mean, I'm not sure. We, you know, there would need to be a study that looks at, you know, sort of the, bring the scientists in and say, okay, we need to understand what are the ecosystem services on which Malmo is actually depending today. How is rain happening? What is regulating our temperature? What is guaranteeing that this, you know, that there's there's marine life that the currents are going in a particular direction? And I think those methodologies also exist, but they haven't yet been brought together. And so I think there's a lot of space of innovation for those impact investors interested in that space of, say, the infrastructure of the sector, uh, to start bringing together those ecological methodologies with the impact metrics and, and, and try to, to move the agenda forward. I want to pick up on that because I got a bit excited there about that. Because uh, uh, when you talked about ecosystem, one thing that uh, when it comes to indicators and measurements, uh, when it, an example that I, I usually talk about is the is um, the coral coral reefs, and uh, and um, which is an example of how how we o not always have the right indicators for 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 the dynamic systems that we're dealing with and complexity that we're dealing with, and and coral reefs uh, often when they they have used coral cover and measured how how much as big an area. Uh, a coral reef is to to as a measurement of the if the coral reef is healthy or not. But um, so so how much um, uh, if that shrinks, for example, then you you can uh, you can talk about it's less healthy, etc. But but it's a very bad measurement because it could it could uh, it could turn um, uh, a coral reef can turn into an algae algae mush system. <laughs> In a very short time, they can flip, so um, you can measure the, the the coral coverage as much as you want, but you you might still just have a loss of uh, the coral reef in in a blow, and that measurement won't help you understand where where the system is. The better measurement is actually big herbiv herbivorous fish uh, uh, that graze the reef. Because that's a better measurement of the of the healthy reef. Because if you have a coral bleaching and something that kills the coral, in order for the coral to come back, you need these big grazing fish to 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 graze off the algae. If you don't have them, if if they're fished out and you have a a, a blow like that to the reef, uh, the algae can can uh, settle and and prevent the coral for 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 settling again. So that's a better measurement. So that's that sort of is a measurement that is more linked to the resilience of these systems, and that's the kind of measurements. I don't know what that would be in the social <laughs> domain, but it's worth thinking about. Uh, I think. Yep. <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Mert. Uh, I'm studying masters in sustainable science in Lund University. And Mr. Olson State mentioned that this is a new space for Stockholm Resilience Center to involve. And I've been reading and working with their work for two years. I truly believe that and this is the right space to be as well. And we've been discussing of new paradigms, of new ways of doing science. And I also see that Stockholm Resilience Workshops for Stockholm Resilience Center are also a field of sustainable science. So it's like, like the mm, right, they, they suggest right ways of doing science and also true way to go beyond the orthodox paradigms of science as well. And so as regards to that, we, I think, how do you see the way to go beyond this naive, um, naive perspective, a naive and optimistic perspective of that, okay, we, scientists are going to produce the science and policymakers base their decisions on the science and okay, then we are going to go to the happy future and live happily ever after. But then how do you see how soon the future that um, sustainable scientists or the scientists will go shift to the more transfer transformational mode and act actually as entrepreneurs and through the methods of participatory action research. Thanks. I agree. And, and um, David, you touched upon that too, that uh, um, the old way of decision making, I think, is a, is a very scientific, bureaucratic process. A science deliver, you know, knowledge to the decision maker. And, and then decisions are taking top down. You talked about that top down, which doesn't work very well. And that's we, we've seen that. So I think 
uh, I think scientists have to, as exactly what you said, involve in 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 a different way in in society. So one way is actually what uh, what um, what we talked about here before with the, uh, for example, your biosphere innovation system, for example, uh, Johanna, that you that you have, where you you bring together scientists together with the social entrepreneur, the local people, and then you work together, and and. Um, at least, as, as a scientist becomes uh, part of that process, instead of standing outside and delivering in, you know, you know, throwing things over the fence you know, <laughs> of knowledge, instead engage and and uh, I think it. At least I come I come from natural science, uh, and I think it scares a lot of them <laughs> to do that, <laughs> to engage in that way, but I think it's changing. I think it's happening and. Um, and, and there's, I think there's also some some literature on it actually now how how we can engage more. Others, other other disciplines have been have much longer uh, history of engaging with communities and doing action research, etc. So it's there, and we can we can learn from them, of course. All right. I think. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Björn. Thank you. Um, my question comes to the social aspect of, of investment and environmental impact. And uh, when looked at it holistically, we know that there's no economic sustainability if there's not environmental, ecological sustainability, as Alejandro very well put it. And it cannot be ecologically sustainable if it is not socially sustainable at the same time. But usually the measures tied to social are financial measures. Um, but there are no specific measures for social well-being and impact of enterprises in true social well-being. Do you see or are you working in the realm of social well-being and really relevant indicators of the impact of, of investment in the social realm. I mean, I, I would agree, you know, with the general characterization, and it seems like the practical challenge is when presenting an investment, we understand financial metrics, and uh, it seems acceptable for the moment that we assume uh, social well-being is improved when you increase income. That seems to resonate with a lot of people, yet if you spend time in rural communities, we know that isn't necessarily true and it ne isn't necessarily the best indicator of human or social well-being. So I think the only way I've been able to, it's stories. I don't have good quantifiable approach. I think this is something we're, we're struggling with. Stories seem to be one of the ways that resonates. It's, it's good, but not, not sufficient. Um, and I do feel like there, we, need, we need a new set of metrics to build upon some of the more you know, traditional or currently more acceptable metrics. And one of the challenges around that again and again is um, if you're running a business and then you gotta, you know, gather all these numbers, I mean, the cost of collecting data to enterprises is significant around social environmental impact. So when we see in the developing country context, you know, there's value alignment, but it just, it's too costly. So how are they gonna gather this good data um, we all care about. And so I think there's a challenge around that, getting accurate data to inform uh, effective decision making, whether as an investor or as an entrepreneur, but doing it in a way that is um, cost effective. And I, I don't feel like there are easy answers out there right now. Um, one precedent I see happening out there, they get grant money to support or government support to do the data collection, or you have an academic partner that they come in and, and do the data collection and work with the entrepreneurs on the ground to lessen the burden. Um, I've seen that work uh, actually often quite well to help to have an academic partner to work with uh, um, enterprises. So, to, so that's, I think those are some, some of the answers. Mentioned that. Well, I think that the that linking happiness to healthy environment is a really great idea, uh, and 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 we need more we need more of, of this. Um, th there's two things I think are interesting. One is the Burma, the, the country, has begun exploring how to do an alternative to GDP that would be something on gross happiness, um, and this has been published already. So I think that's something to look to look up uh, in terms of a reference, uh, and the same with the New Economics Foundation in in. Uh, in, in the UK, 
Um, and the way they both deal with it is by, by proxies. Right? So, so what they're asking is, what are the sorts of things people need in order to be happy? And so there's something about education, and there's something about um, health and well-being, and uh, uh, you know, having time, and how do you account for having time? And I think they're very profound questions, and it would be great if uh, you know, scientists and centers could take up the, 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 the issue. My only caveat is that we need to find a way to overcome um, how, uh, you know, the fact that, that, that economic policymakers and real serious investors, you know, with serious faces would think that the word happiness uh, is sort of less important, no? And same thing for education, same thing for a number of things that we care about. So there's almost like a cultural thing there as well uh, to figure out of how, to, how, when we link happiness to a healthy environment, how do we portray it as, as, a, as a serious conversation as well that needs, needs to be taken into account. <clears throat> Thank you so much for uh, contributing to us better understanding biosphere economy. Uh, Thank you very much.